it's becoming increasingly clear that uh, this is an important issue. So uh, for, for topics such as medical and clinical uh, trials, we've seen over the past year during the pandemic that um, having an adequate representation of different groups in treatments and clinical trials is extremely important. Um, however, also for basic research, this is an important issue both because basic research will eventually potentially lead to clinical applications, um, but also because I think we, we want to understand the, the, all of the basic biological principles behind what we're studying, which includes sex and gender dimensions. Um, and finally, this is also important for, for computational models and algorithms where um, there may be biases in the data used. Um, so I think the goal of this workshop is, is first and foremost to learn about uh, how to incorporate sex and gender into research design. Um, we think, I think some of you may have questions and concerns about this, so we, we will hopefully discuss them today and address them. And then finally, um, and possibly most importantly, we want to we want everyone to think about how to actually explicitly incorporate these things into into each of your research uh, topics. So uh, with that, I think we uh, can get started. So on the on the screen that I'm sharing, we have an overview of the plan for today. So we're going to start off with a presentation by our external expert, uh, Professor Sabine ortelt Prigione, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, following that and a, and a Q&A, we're going to have two internal researcher experiences from two individuals at the Champalimau, Dr. Fatima Cardoso first, and then uh, after a, a short break, Clara Ferreira. Um, then we will have this final uh, section where we can think about how to practically apply these ideas. And we're going to organize some uh, breakout rooms. We're going to divide people up uh, and ask you to, to just discuss uh, ideas about how you can incorporate these things into your research. So we hope a lot of you will stick around for that because we think it's a pretty important part of this workshop. Uh, finally, then we'll return, uh, ask for, for a sort of summary from, from each of the groups. Um, and then have some closing remarks. Okay, so let's get things started. Um, so let me maybe stop sharing the screen now. Um, so it's my great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Professor Sabine ortel Prigioni now. Um, she holds a medical degree from the University of Milan with a specialization in internal medicine as well as a Master's of Science in Public Health from the University of London and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a Medical Doctorate from the Charité Medical University in Berlin. And she's been working on sex and gender dimensions in research and medicine for a long time, uh, both in scientific terms, as well as thinking about social and institutional aspects of this. Uh, for example, she is a co-editor of one of the first textbooks on, on the topic of sex and gender in clinical medicine, she developed the first international database on sex and gender specific research. And in 2014, she won the, she won the Max Rubner Prize for innovations of the Charité Foundation for the first project in the field of sexual harassment in German hospitals. So since 2018, uh, she's a professor and physician of internal medicine, gender medicine, and public health at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, uh, Netherlands, where she's also the strategic chair for gender in primary and transmural care. So uh, as you can see from the short bio, she is a, a world expert in, in these issues and we're very lucky to have her with us today. Um, so without further ado, please take it away, Sidney. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, first of all, for the uh, kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to the workshop today and, and especially to hear what, um, how you think all of this might apply to, to your work. So I've been doing these, uh, let's say trainings and workshop for, for some time now. Of course, the format we're having is slightly different than, than what it used to be. But I think by now we all kind of find our ways to, to deal with the situation. And the most, most exciting part is usually after I've told you a bit of the, the background of this hearing and how this could potentially apply to the work you're doing, 
And um, this, I hope, is, is an enriching experience for you, but it's also an interesting experience for me to hear how, how you think this could apply to your, to your work. Because um, the approach I have to this whole field is really kind of a cross-cutting cross uh, approach. I'm not based in one single discipline, but what we're doing uh, with my group is trying to look at methodology and implementation at all levels. And so what I hear from you is also interesting for me, and it kind of brings us for further as well. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to the last part where, where I'll hear from, uh, from you and how that applies. But before that, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna share my, my slides and my screen with you. Uh, let me just put that in presenter mode. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, can I have a nod? Thank you. Um, and, and we're gonna cover quite some ground, I think, uh, this, this morning, um, my idea is to give you an overview. And of course, I'm not going to speak for three hours. I'm going to try to keep it around half an hour so that you have the opportunity to ask questions. But the things we, I'd like to cover with you is, first of all, um, what does it mean to consider the, the gender dimension? So sex and gender in research, according to the EU Commission, because as, as Bill said before, regardless of whether you like it or not, in one way or another, a lot of funding institutions are asking to do this, um, which means that uh, more and more people are, are confronted with the reality of having to, to think how to incorporate this. And so where, where does this come from and what does that mean? And it's not just for the EU Commission, a lot of national funding agencies are also mirroring some of what the EU is asking. So it, it might well be that uh, some national funding agencies will also ask for this. Then I'll briefly touch upon what it means um, to do sex specific analysis in research and innovation. So which kind of aspects do you have to consider when you do sex specific analysis? And what does it mean to do gender specific analysis? Today, we'll focus a bit more on, on the biological aspects of this. So more on the sex specific, although I'll give you some background on gender specific as well, because everybody who's working with humans, um, so that means if you have to do, uh, if you do clinical work or if you, you have to do with individuals who will donate tissues and cells and who will be involved in the research, that might be an aspect to still take into consideration. So it's not enough to just say we're working on cells and so it doesn't matter. And then I'll give you a few examples of what can go well and what can go wrong if, if you actually don't do that in, in trying to, to foster a bit of the discussion we'll have afterwards. I have a few brief uh, conclusion remarks about why content and context are connected. And this is really just one slide because as, as Bill said initially, we're not talking about representation today, although it is an, an important aspect in, in the research practice. And it is something that we, we have to keep in mind. It's not the focus of what we will do today. So today we're focusing on content and how to, to do this in practice. And then I'll show you a few resources. And uh, uh, these are not exhaustive. I will, I will send some more to, to Laura afterwards and they will be made accessible to everybody who participated in the workshop. So what is the gender dimension? I'm showing you here still the Horizon 2020 slide simply because Horizon Europe has started, but the first calls will come out officially in the coming weeks. So we are in the process. A lot of us have seen some informal, um, yeah, well, calls for, for the future grants. So this is not completely uh, published yet. And the gender dimension aspect will not change. It will actually become more than, than what it is at this point, but it is a good, good starting point. So what the EU talks about when, when they address the gender dimension is really they're addressing three levels. So one is this one, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So integrating gender and sex analysis in research and innovation. So that's the content part. And then there's two other dimensions that they want you to address whenever you form a consortium under Horizon Europe which is gender balance in the research teams. So how many women and men are actually participating in the research team and gender balance in decision-making. And what they mean here is that you don't want a leadership that is strictly male as it sometimes is or frequently is. They really would like you to try to make an effort as much as possible within the field where you're working because of course this applies differently to different fields. Uh, in having gender balance in decision making. And this is actually one of the criteria for the final award of the, of the consortium uh, for, the, for the funding. So it's something to keep in mind. So as I just said, this shows us that there are two levels that can be taken into consideration. 
the content level, so the analysis and research, and the context level. Today, we will focus on this part. Why do we need the gender dimension? Well, this is uh, an excerpt from, from different funding agencies all over the world. So this is Horizon 2020, which I just showed you. And what the EU Commission says is that considering the gender dimension will help you improve the scientific quality and societal relevance of the produced knowledge, technology, and or innovation. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research, so this is the Institute of Gender and Health, say that it improves the rigor, reproducibility, and generalizability of science, so it's about excellence. And the NIH says that incorporating, in this case, sex as a biological variable enhances the reproducibility through rigor and transparency. So if I think back about 10, 15 years, the discourse around sex and gender was completely different and it was definitely not framed this way. And now we're actually seeing that these matters do contribute to reproducibility or the robustness of results. They can contribute to excellence. And of course, if you consider that your results are applicable to all of the population and not just 50% of it, of course, it also has a different societal value, especially considering that a lot of our research is funded by public taxpayer money. Okay, so let's move on to the content. I'll start briefly with the terminology because um, there's a lot of confusion about what, what it is that sex and gender sensitive healthcare or research really means. And this is, um, well, sometimes it's connected to bad intentions, but in general, it has to do with the fact that with the concept of gender, we're trying to implement a concept from the social sciences and humanities within the strongly positivist discipline of biomedical research. So it's, very, it's really two different philosophical approaches to science and to how science can be conducted and, and hence which methodologies can be used. And so the challenge here is really, how can we use a concept that is um, developed in a completely different research discipline and make it work within a different system? So going from something that can be investigated mostly qualitatively into something that's mostly quantitatively based. And in the last few years, I think we've made quite some steps forward in framing gender really as a multi-layered construct and trying to take apart which different instances play a role. So when we talk about the sex differences, we're really starting here at the core, so with genetics and hormones, and then with gender, we kind of talk about all the other aspects of an individual, and that can go from identity, which is, if you want, more of the subjective perspective, so do I identify as a woman, as a man, as a non-binary person, and there's ways to investigate that. Then there's the role part, which is more or less what society expects you to be and how society expects you to behave as a woman or as a man in a certain place and time in history and in a certain culture. When we come to relationships, if you want, it's uh, in simple terms, the interaction between the two. So your personal identity and your personal perception and beliefs compared to what is expected of you from outside and what does that mean in terms of negotiation of care duties, of work duties, of salary, of um, professional advancement and so forth. So these relationships can play out at the personal level and at the professional level. And then there's another layer which uh, sometimes is investigated, not always, but it's, it's worth mentioning, which is institutional gender. And it is pretty much what, what society expects you to be or what an organization specifically expects you to be as a CEO or as a professor or as a manager, as a director. So how are you supposed to behave? What is expected of you? And in which way does gender affect that? And, and most importantly, what happens if you don't conform to what is expected? So I will start looking at these parts and later on we will pick up some of those as well. All right, let's start with this one. I think one of the most important aspects to keep in mind is that every cell has a sex. And if I think back 20 years ago, when I was studying medicine, when we talked about sex chromosomes, it was pretty much confined to the development of secondary sexual characteristics. This is what we considered when we talked about the, the sex chromosomes. I then started working in, in immunology and, and there we, we had a closer look at the X because the X harbors a lot of immunologically relevant genes. And I was also working in the field of autoimmunity where there's a strong skewing between uh, prevalence of disease in women and men. So there we started taking a step further 
And by now we know that these chromosomes can have an effect on every single somatic cell. So it is not just about sex, uh, sexual uh, dimorphism. Now I will take a few steps in, in what you should or could consider when we, we operationalize sex. So let's say you, you want to analyze uh, sex in your cells or you wanna analyze in, in how far it affects your experiments. So which assumptions do you actually carry with you when, when you start with that? So in general, in, in biomedical research, we assume that there is a dichotomy between XX female and XY male. And we kind of split out, if we actually do, we split out our samples in, in, these, two, in these two levels, which is already a good first step in, in trying to investigate these differences. However, and I would really like to, to stimulate a bit of the discussion later on, we know that not everybody is XX and XY, and there's different things to take into consideration. So one is that there are chromosomal anomalies, which are quite rare, uh, but they are present in the population. And then there is a degree of individuals within the population, depending on which statistics you look at, it can be from 007 to 1.7, so almost 2%. It depends quite a bit on how this is measured and quantified who are not uh, clearly identifiable as XX and XY and whose anatomical and physiological development does not clearly match this dichotomy. So the relevance of this was to start a discussion about the fact that it is sometimes tricky to, to separate into clear groups. And most importantly, taking into consideration DSD, so differences in sex development or diseases of sex development as we used to call them, means that there are a series of uh, syndromes or different uh, developments that might actually have an impact on the work you're doing and might actually clarify some of the differences we don't really investigate. Why is that important? Because none of us, or at least most of us, have no idea if they're XX or XY. And this is something we will carry on later on um, most of us have never been tested about this because there is, in most cases, no need to do this. However, as I just said, it is possible, depending on which statistics you look at, that about 2% of the population have a certain anatomical presentation and might actually be not XX or XY as you would expect based on the anatomy. So even in, in the research we're doing, a lot of times it might be worthwhile to, to briefly think about whether a karyotype for some type of research. It's not something that should be done all the time, might be worthwhile. Let's look at the hormones. Um, you have many different hormones you can measure, of course, and depending on what you're studying, it might be worthwhile to study them or not. So the hormones that can be studied are anything from estradiol, which is the most bioactive uh, sex hormone. And we, we are starting to, to not necessarily call them sex hormones anymore because in the past, again, if you think um, about how this was studied uh, 20 years ago, we had, again, a total dichotomy between female sex hormones and male sex hormones. And while it is, of course, true that these are mostly much higher in female biological organisms and these are much higher in male biological organisms, we also know that the production A fluctuates and that testosterone is also produced by female organisms and estrogens are also produced by male organisms. Of course, to different degrees and at different levels and this changes throughout the lifespan. But the, again, um, assuming that there is just a clear dichotomy might make some experiments difficult to, to understand and reproduce. So you can measure several hormones. These can be collected in different ways. You can measure them in the blood, in the saliva. And is it important to measure hormones? And of course, this is a question that depends on which kind of work you're doing. So in some cases, it might not be needed. In other cases, it might well be needed. And I think what I would like you to stimulate to think about is if it actually matters to the work you're doing. Um, and, and why do I say that? Because uh, I worked in the field of autoimmunity for, for a few years before uh, moving on to doing uh, public health. And while working there, I realized that we really take uh, the hormonal influx um, not completely and thoroughly into account. So we do maybe stimulate cells with estrogens or testosterone, but a lot of times when it comes to individuals, 
where we take ourselves from, we don't necessarily look at which phase, if we're talking about premenopausal women, which phase of the cycle they are in. And if we consider that in the first and the follicular phase, we have higher levels of estrogens, and in the luteal phase, we have higher levels of progesterone, and this has an impact on whether you have more of a Th1 response or a Th2 response, it might be worthwhile to consider which phase of the cycle a woman who might be contributing to a study finds herself in. And this is rarely, rarely measured and rarely taken into consideration. Furthermore, for example, the behavior of regulatory T cells changes around the ovulation. So all of these factors don't have to be done in standard ways. But if, for example, you're investigating uh, cytokine production and T cell responses in individuals being exposed, let's say, to an infectious disease like COVID, and you do that in a younger population, and especially in women who are premenopausal, it might be worthwhile to have a look at, you know, how is the hormonal profile and does that actually potentially confound your results? Because depending on whether you took the blood here or you took the blood here, the response you're finding might simply be different. And not because you did anything wrong or your PhD or postdoc did anything wrong, but simply because there is a different priming depending on the organism. One important aspect to consider here is that these variations have been described in, in humans. However, in, in rats and mice, considering that the average cycle is about four days, um, there is a consensus at this point that it doesn't really necessarily matter to consider estrogen and progesterone level in all these mice when you do the experiments. And the thought, the assumption behind this is that in, in human females, the follicular phase and the luteal phase, um, the duration is on average about 10 days. So assuming a 28 day cycle, you can say about 10 days you're here and about 10 days you're here, which can change transcriptional profiles. However, in a mouse or in a rat, where you have these cycles, of 28 days condensed in four days, there is not enough time to actually see transcriptional differences between the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So um, there's, a, there's a very good uh, review about this. I'm, I'm happy to share that if anybody has questions about that later on, uh, where Prendergast has, has put together uh, an overview of all the, the studies that we've had thus far. And it is unless specifically necessary for your work, not necessary to, to keep that in mind every time you work with rats and mice which is a common fear. When we move on to the models we're working with, I've been talking mostly about humans and cells this far, but of course a lot of work is being done in animals. And, and for a long time, we, we assumed that um, we could pretty much produce um, a completely controlled system when working with these animals. So we have inbred mice strains and we can control pretty much everything. We can control their caging systems. We can control what they eat. We can control what they, the temperatures. We can control how much CO2 they breathe. They breathe. They, we can control how much sound they're exposed to and all these different things. What we didn't really consider is in how far this might have a different impact on the female and the male animals. So for example, you have soy-based chows that might have a different impact on female and male animals. The social dynamics and behaviors might be different depending on whether you have uh, six female rats in a cage or six male rats. I mean, you all know that a lot of times this doesn't go very well. So you have to make decisions on how many animals to, to, to house in one cage. Um, how does it work in terms of micro microbes? This is a very exciting new field where we know that there's differences in the microbiome between female and male animals. And these have also been recorded in humans. There's of course a lot of confounding factors because we know that diet plays a huge role, environmental stressors and so forth. But in these animals that are housed in comparable conditions, we still find uh, differences. However, if you house them in micro my microbially sterile environments, the way their, their uh, microbiome develops might be different in females and males. So all of these things that we control can potentially have an impact and that might well be different in female and male animals. So I, I refer you to, to this um, link where, where these are all described in more detail if you're interested in it. And of course, um, the question that usually comes at that point is, well, well, what can we do? How can we control all of this? 
uh, you will not be able to control all of this, but it's possible to at least report it so that if somebody else does the same experiment, they know what to look for. So I think reporting might be a really important point. Here. Just a few things as food for thought, and maybe we can pick some of those up in the discussion afterwards. What I usually ask in these, in these uh, workshops is, do you know the sex of your cell cultures? Um, I don't see you all. I just see one or two people at the time. Usually there's a quite em embarrassed um, silence here. So I don't want any answers, but it turns out that a lot of researchers have no clue what the sex of their cell culture is. And even if they do, um, a second thing to keep in consideration is the stability of karyotypes. So we know very well that, that, for example, tumor cell lines, which have been in culture for a long time, lose their karyotypes or change their karyotypes. And the same thing can apply for sex chromosomes. So you can have multiple Xs or actually lose the X altogether, lose the Y, uh, if you have cell uh, cultures in, in, in culture for after many passages. So this is also one thing to keep in mind and how far that might interrupt. If you, for example, do things to your cells like reprogramming, reprogramming changes the methylation patterns of the cells. And that has a huge impact on the X because one of the two Xs is generally inactivated, although a number of genes escape inactivation. But once you reprogram the cells, you actually demethylate the inactivated X cell. So what happens once you then move on to a uh, finally, um, developed human, uh, developed uh, adult cell again. So when you move from through this whole process, so what happens to the methylation patterns? And open questions where I haven't seen any answers yet is, well, what happens uh, depending on which hormonal additions you use for the media? So let's say you test the effect of testosterone or estrogen. Is there a difference if these are synthetic rather than if these are purified, if these are humanized? Uh, are there uptake differences? Does that impact? And are there intrinsic differences, for example, in growth? Um, I've talked to quite a few researchers that said, well, we use the same medium, but we see differences in growth rates of the cells, depending on whether they're, they're female or male. We have no idea why. So these are just a few things to, to keep in mind. And as, as a final slide about reporting sex, here's a few suggestions. Well, what we would like to know, ideally, when you describe a study or when you write a grant proposal is, first of all, what's the rationale? So what do you expect based on the literature uh, about the effect of sex on your performance? Why does it make sense? That's kind of what the, the funding agencies want from you is to hear why it makes sense or why does it not make sense? If you're studying prostate cancer, you don't need to study both, study both sexes unless you have an absolutely super specific question where it matters. So what is the potential effect? The second layer is what's your experimental setup? We would like to know how many subjects, how many cells, how many animals, and break them down in table one. Uh, this happens quite well with human studies, uh, with trials in animal studies. We still uh, lack this information, although it's really basic and most of you know this, uh, it's really not reported as well. Ideally describe some of the confounders, as I just said, housing conditions, chow, light and dark and so forth, can all have an impact on, on how your animals behave. So you might want to report these. Um, consider potential interactions, for example, sex interacting with age and so forth. Please, and this I think is the most important aspect, try to report your results in a sex disaggregated manner. Because what we have in the ideal first step is knowing how many female and male cells have been included, how many uh, female and male subjects, but then when it comes to the analysis, everything is lumped together. And I'll show you later why that can be a problem. So if you can keep this disaggregated or at least put that in the supplementary material, if somebody else wants to do a meta-analysis later on, they have this data and they can work with this. And then of course, let us know why what you found is important. So, so far for sex. And I will then move on to, to gender. And this will be a bit shorter, as I said, because I assume for, for some of you, it might not necessarily be relevant, but I think it's worthwhile to, to know because as I said, the, the funding agencies ask about it. I already explained this slide. So we're kind of going back to these concepts of identity, role, and relationships. Um, as I said, we will not go in the depths of theory. There's no time for this today, but just a few examples of how, for example, you can ask uh, about gender identity. So usually in questionnaires, we have one question that asks, um, 
what gender are you or what sex are you depending not just on the on the questionnaire but a lot of times on the language you're speaking because different for example different european languages have different ways of um translating the concept of sex and gender in a lot of languages there are not two concepts and also the answers to these vary so it's not just a, a question of of what kind of research you're doing is also a linguistic question. But ideally, what, what is being uh, supported as uh, the most informative and, and feasible thing in surveys is to ask two questions. So what sex were you assigned at birth? So are you biologically female, male, or intersex, or sex not listed here? So you can leave that open if people want to add something or prefer not to spawn, of course. And then the second question can be, what's your current gender identity? Woman, man, non-binary, gender queer. You can ask, add a lot of different questions here. But this will give you, especially if you work in the field um, of hormonal impact on, on disease and on, on health, uh, it will give you a clearer idea about which individuals are being included. And if we consider that the number of transgender individuals who are actually transitioning, who are taking some kind of hormone and who might not be visible right away in front of you, especially if somebody is doing a survey, you have no clue who's filling that in. This will give you enough information to A, be more inclusive and B, have the right materials and right information to then do an analysis, which is actually robust and does not give you strange results. There are certain alternatives. Um, you can try to use some people are trying to use that it, it it works well sometimes it works in a lot of cases it's more complicated but you can use a scale from one to nine uh one is i feel a hundred percent as a woman to a little bit less then on five you would have somebody who identifies as non-binary and nine you would have somebody who says i'm i feel a hundred percent as a man you can use that uh give people an option so if they don't want to fill this in this is a topic that is being politically instrumentalized quite quite a bit, unfortunately, and which leads the discussion away from the science in, in another domain. So some people don't want to answer this, give them the opportunity. And please consider that this is not gender expression. So gender identity is one thing. Gender expression is, in this case, you would have two scales, one about femininity and one about masculinity. And people can say, well, I feel from zero to 100%, I don't know, this and this feminine, and on a scale from zero to 100%, this and this masculine. So people can have the opportunity to use both. When it comes to gender roles, there's a series of questionnaires. I'm just showing you the BAM sex role inventory. This is the one most widely used. There's a lot of critique to it, but it is still being used and it can be used in certain forms. We, we are also using it sometimes. Um, it has been developed in the 70s and it, it has been developed at the time to, to break up the idea that being a man or a woman are two poles, two extreme poles on one line. Uh, it, it was what Sandra Bam was trying to do was trying to show that people have masculinity and femininity attributes and let's say neutral attributes or uh, androgynous attributes regardless of, of how, how we see them. So that was the, the starting point of it. It's still being widely used, as I said, uh, you need to be careful about what you do with it. So you need to be well informed about what it does. But um, if there's questions, I'm happy to address them later. But I think it goes a bit too far. It's just good that you see it because it's the most widely used instrument. You can investigate gender relations. When you investigate gender relations, the one message I would like to convey is uh, always ask subjective perception and try to measure that in some objective way. And so, for example, what, what was asked here was about the equality in, in the household and the equality in, in distribution of, of household tasks. And if you look at what, what people said when, when they were asked about their self-perception, most people will say, well, our relationship is totally equal with my partner, whoever they are, or it's, it's quite equal. Uh, but then when you actually ask about who is devoting how many hours to childcare, to doing chores, to organizing the household and so forth, you usually find quite striking differences. So if you want to investigate gender relations, if that matters to the work you're doing, just consider that you might want to employ a subjective and some kind of possibly more objective measure, because here there's a lot of social desirability bias involved in, in these instruments. There have been attempts in the last few years, uh, and this is the, the last slide about the, the gender investigation. There have been attempts in the last few years to try to bring different dimensions together in one index. 
um, which of course is helpful, I would say, in the context of cohort studies in medicine. If you know how it works with cohort studies, we always have a limited amount of time that people can allocate to filling them in. So you want to squeeze as much information into uh, as little time as possible. So of course, trying to find a combined score is uh, an option. As you can see, some of the, the dimensions I, I mentioned before, the roles and the, and the relationships are in here as well. The BAM sex role inventory is in here as well. There are a lot of um, critical points. So I think it is definitely a step forward uh, in one sense. However, th there are also critical points to these instruments because as I said before, we had a discussion in the 70s about the fact that people are not uh, zero from, from zero to 100% either woman or man, but we, we already had the discussion about the fact that you can have many different uh, identity layers within people and you want to represent that. And that's important, I think, in our communication with, with individuals participating in research and with patients. And so some of these instruments actually go back a step. So that, that's something to, to discuss. However, uh, it is an attempt to bring, bring all of these together. So regarding the, the reporting of gender, um, what, what should we consider here? So of course, some of these things are similar to the reporting of sex, but, but some are different. So first of all, again, the rationale, why do you think gender matters and in which form? What is really important when you study gender, and as I said before, it's a concept we are basically importing from a different research uh, discipline. So which kind of concept of gender are you working with? in your research. So do you want to use an index uh, then to measure it, which brings together different scales? Do you want to measure individual domains of gender? Maybe it only matters what you know, gender relationships are to, to your work. So make that explicit and let us know what you want to do. This is a critical step that is, is done way too little, which is one of the reasons why we have a lot of confusing results, I would say, simply because it's not completely clear uh, what the assumptions here were. We would like to know the number of subjects, as I said before, break it down by gender in case, for example, that you measure identity and role and relations, let us know. Um, are you working intersectionally? So not all women and men can be placed in a bucket. Not all women are the same, not all men are the same. Somebody doesn't identify as women or men at all. And how do you take into consideration, for example, other social domains? How do you take into consideration ethnicity and all these other factors? So if you consider gender, you might have to, to broaden that. Um, in sometimes, depending on which kind of research you do, especially if it's qualitative, you might have to report on your own concepts and biases on gender. So how are you biased as a researcher when you go into this? Again, and that's the important aspect I would like to stress again is, Ideally, please report your analysis in a disaggregated manner, at least put it in the supplementary materials, but so, so that people can pick it up again when we have to do uh, meta-analysis and of course discuss the implications. Before moving on to the examples, just one thing. When, when we talk about humans, it is very difficult to completely disentangle sex and gender. And um, I, I would really recommend this, this review, which was done by Laurie Heise and colleagues, for the Lancet edition in 2019 about, about gender. So they had one coming out in February where, where they really have an entire collection about how gender impacts health. And what they try to bring together in this figure, which, which I think is done quite well, is we're starting with sex aspects. So the genes, the hormones, external genitalia, body features. This is what we start with. Of course, there's, if you want already an in utero part, but, but let's start here. And then this little individual will grow uh, in a society in a certain place in time. And what happens is you're exposed to a lot of structural and social determinants of health. So there are gendered systems in your family, in your community, in institutions, in, in policies and so forth, which will affect your opportunity to interact with society. And most importantly, in our case, with the healthcare system. So this will have an impact on how you develop and what your opportunities are. And at the end, it might lead to gender differences in exposure to disease, for example, depending on the job you're doing, the stress you're exposed to. It might change health behaviors. So what is expected of you in terms of femininity and masculinity in your culture and in how far does that translate into healthy or unhealthy health behavior? Um, it might have an impact on access to care, especially in systems where we don't have universal health care, but where you have to pay. Uh, it might be an important factor. 
the health systems in themselves can be biased. And of course, um, then it depends a bit on, on the research systems, the institutions and the data collection. So all of that can lead to potential inequalities, but most importantly, these lived experience can, can then in turn change your hormones. Definitely it can change, have some epigenetic impacts, which can also be transgenerational. So taking these two apart in, in humans is, is complicated. All right. Now, a few things that can go wrong if, if you don't do this and, and why is it, is it important to take that into consideration? So the first risk I would say is really the reduced reproducibility. And I think we're, we're having quite, quite large discussions about reproducibility in the community in the last years. And this is an essential aspect to this. So this, I, I urge you to, to have a look at this paper in 2014, which has been quite seminal uh, about the role that researchers themselves can have on the subject research. So what they do, this is a group of Jeff Mogul, I'll, I'll talk about him later for another uh, subject. They investigate pain and uh, the response to analgesics. And basically what they found in, in short terms is they saw that depending on who the investigator was, so if they were a biological male or a biological female, impacted the reaction of the animals involved in the studies. So if it was a male investigator, basically what happened was that the female animals smelled the male investigator's pheromone and acted differently than if the investigator was female. So this paper provoked a lot of discussion about the fact that this is really something we, we didn't take into consideration. We, as I said before, in animal study, we always think we can control uh, most factors. For some, we really don't know, and experimenters themselves had not been one element that we considered. Again, we might not be able to, to completely standardize this, but it would be worthwhile to keep that in mind and possibly report it. So experimenter sex can cross species actually affect behavioral uh, phenomena in rats and mice. So report it at least for reproducibility. When it comes to uh, second aspect, the second risk uh, in ignoring sex and gender differences is delayed diagnosis. So this is a very clinical aspect. And this has to do in a way with our biases. So for example, women with bladder cancer and hematuria, so of blood in their urine, are a lot of times diagnosed much later than men with the same phenomenon because we think they have a urinary tract infection. This makes sense epidemiologically because the likelihood is indeed higher that a woman has a urinary tract infection, fortunately, than bladder cancer. However, if she doesn't, the delay between the first symptoms and reporting and the diagnosis of bladder cancer is much longer in women than in men. Um, when it comes to asthma, for example, women um, are less likely diagnosed in girls especially, when, when they're young, the symptoms might not be the typical wheezing symptoms that we see in boys, so they might be diagnosed later. Um, when it comes to osteoporosis and depression, these are generally diagnosed later, uh, if at all, in men because they're perceived as female diseases. And this, uh, this is an interesting study that I like to report here just to, to show uh, an example is when it comes to multiple sclerosis, which is notoriously uh, difficult to diagnose, an autoimmune disease, um, patients a lot of times meet many different physicians before they get diagnosed. And if you ask female and male patients, a lot of times the, the women have met a psychiatrist sometime along the way, while men usually don't and they might have met an orthopedic surgeon. So there are definitely biases in who, who we refer to whom. When it comes to algorithm bias, and this is risk number three, um, I would urge you to have a look at Joy Bulamwini's work at, at MIT. Basically, she, she is a, a black woman who investigated um, commercial algorithms for facial recognition. And she experienced on herself that she was not recognized by these algorithms. So she has dark skin and she's a woman, which are two factors that were problematic for, for the uh, facial recognition algorithm. And so what she did is she used an entire panel of different uh, faces of individuals from parliaments in different countries. And you see women and men on both spectra with light skin or dark skin and blurred or less blurred. And what she found out with these commercial algorithms was that if you're a white man, you do perfectly fine with all the algorithms. So there's basically no mistakes. So 
So this is light men, zero, here there's three, and here there's one. And if you are a woman or a dark skinned person, it depends a bit on the algorithm. So some algorithms um, don't really care if you're light or dark skinned as long as you're men. So you see here, the men do well, the women do poorly regardless of what. And some have more issues with dark skin than with light skin. In general, if you're a dark skinned female as Joy Bulamwini is, uh, you might have the biggest issue with, with these uh, algorithms. Of course, the algorithms are not racist in themselves, but we train them. We train them with certain data sets. And so the training data set we use, of course, makes the algorithm better at recognizing patterns in certain frameworks than in others. And if we translate that to medicine, if we use, for example, uh, outdated databases about a correlation between symptoms and, for example, coronary heart disease, and we use older, all the databases where we have a significant male bias and an underdiagnosis of women, simply because the, the symptoms were not collected appropriately, we might just perpetuate that. So having a larger data set is not automatically helpful if you don't purge it of the bias that is inherent to it. Another consequence is a lack of detection of latent sex differences. And this is something which would also be interesting to maybe discuss later on. What, what we're seeing in, in the last years is that there might well be comparable phenotypes or similar disease entities between female and male organisms, but the origin of the phenotype might be different. And what I'm showing you here is an example from pain, but this can be found in similar ways in pain and diabetes and in heart failure. So again, this is again from, from Jeff Mogul's group. What they were investigating was pain response and most importantly, how do you provoke analgesia? And what they saw was that in the male animals, if you targeted microglia, you could uh, generate analgesia. If you targeted the microglia in intact females, nothing happened, unless you removed all the T cells, then it worked. However, if the females were intact and you didn't modulate that before, in the female animals, the population of cells to target were the T cells. Targeting the microglia, which are macrophages basically, didn't make a difference these were the, the cells to target. So it showed that you have a comparable end phenomenon, pain, but the cells involved in the inflammation and in production of pain were different, which of course is important for us, let's say as clinicians in the future, because you might have to treat different cells in different ways. For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip one and I'm gonna to move to the last one, which is, um, the risk, and possibly if I haven't convinced you by now, I hope this one will convince you, is mortality due to increased unexpected side effects. So these are 10 drugs that have been pulled from the US market in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, of these uh, different drugs that were targeting all kinds of, of different uh, systems in the organism, about four uh, were mostly connected to torsade de point. Torsade de point is an extremely rare spontaneous arrhythmia, so it, it rarely happens spontaneously, but it is a well-known side effect, which mostly affects women. And in fact, of these 10 drugs, eight had a significant higher incidence of side effects in women, and in, in several cases, a deadly uh, consequence of side effects. And if we took a step back, where does this come from? Well, in the up until 93, women were excluded from clinical trials in the United States. So we had no clinical information about the effectiveness of these drugs in women. And a lot of times in the preclinical work in cells and animals, female organisms were not considered. So the risk is that we simply ignore certain information that we need. And uh, we might say this is at the end of the 90s, but we, we just looked into trials for COVID research uh, we're not doing so much better. We're doing somewhat better. We're including more women, but when it comes to the analysis, there's a lot of lacking information. Just one slide about the context, and then uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions that I might have generated. There is one point, uh, and really just one I would like to make. When it comes to the context, uh, of course, we've had discussions about the political implication of research and the representation, how important it is to have diverse teams. But when it comes specifically to the work on, on sex and gender uh, sensitive research, this work from, from my colleague Matthias Nielsen in, in Denmark is probably very well exemplifying the issue. He was looking at uh, more than a million publications in, in PubMed, and he was looking for gender sensitive analysis. So, so they went through all these publications and had a look at whether 
the researchers included information about sex and gender. And um, the striking uh, definition, the striking finding that they had here was that depending on the number of women on the team or the inclusion of women on the team, if you had women as first authors, as last authors, or represented in a group, the likelihood of having a gender sensitive analysis went up by more than one point, by, by a point. So who does the research? And this is really just a, a very simple picture of this, but I think it's quite defining. Who does the research, of course, defines which questions we're asking. And it defines how we're approaching this and which problems we're seeing because our lived experiences do impact the issues we see. So context does matter also on the content we perform. And as we've seen, even with animals, we cannot always be objective. And there is definitely a connection between context and content. And with that, I thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions and look forward to, to hear uh, what you think about that. Okay, thanks very much, Sabine. Um, so we are already uh, a little bit tight on time. So let's just take uh, five minutes or so to start the discussion now with questions, and then we can continue that uh, a bit later. So if anybody has any questions, um, maybe you can use the raise hand button. And uh, otherwise, if you prefer, you can also type the questions into the chat. Um, and we'll try to call on people. Um, I guess, Maybe I can I can start with one question. Um, so let's say you're you're a researcher working with a, an animal model, and your your research plan is based on say many years of research, um, which happen to use only males or or only females. And uh, if you want to start incorporating both sexes into your research, you would have to say repeat a whole series of mm -hmm. experiments that you rely on. Um, how do you think? uh this sort of problem should be addressed well we're, we're seeing that over and over and it's quite prominent for example in the field of neuroscience that that mostly male animals are being used also in, in cardiovascular research the, the one exception here is possibly immunological work which is mostly done in female animals actually um, and of course the the information you rely on comes from from let's say a discipline uh, that has been developed over the years and what will initially happen I think if you if you look at both sexes, you might actually contradict some of the findings. So assume that everything has been done in male mice, and at a certain point you work with female mice, and and you find results that contradict what what is the the accepted uh, mechanism in in the field. So several researchers have gone through that, um, and what what the way to to do this is usually to to then pick up and do the experiment in both animals. And what will happen is. If you include, let's say everything has been done in male mice, you will work with female mice, you'll find a difference. And then the way to, to do this is actually do it in the male mice again, confirm in probably, you will find the same thing that everybody has been finding in the male mice, but show that in the female mice, it's not working. And I think while that was very tricky about 15 years ago, there is enough literature at the moment and there is enough attention um, to yeah. not prompt uh, a complete overhaul in, in your disciplines anymore. So I think people right by now are, um, I think much more accepting of the fact that, that, there are, that there are simply lacks in information and we haven't, haven't done this. So if you can actually prove that with the same system, you find the results that, that were done before in the male mice, but you find something completely different in the females and you wanna go ahead and, and investigate that. I don't think you'll have very much backlash anymore today. Uh, it would have been completely different 15 years ago. Um, and there are enough examples in, in different disciplines of this actually happening. And so I, I don't expect um, huge resistance. It might actually open up new, new avenues. And I think when we look at the, the pandemic right now, a lot of uh, things we're learning about COVID, um, and this has been possibly in all the tragedy of, of the COVID pandemic, it is showing us how important it is to take sex and gender differences into consideration. Because a lot of the things we're finding, a lot of the pathways and, and molecules involved, we actually find because we look at sex differences. So the role of TLR7 
has been found because people were looking at sex differences and the role of you know ACE, ACE2 modulation through hormones has been found because we were looking at sex differences and so this is actually pushing research forward it's not it's not a political discussion it's really about trying to to find new new avenues to investigate the ACO pathogenesis of, of a disease so I think um, this is really the essential part of it Okay, so I think I don't see any any other hands raised. Let's let's move on for now. Yes, uh, just no. just one thing. <laughs> Maybe okay. just one thing before before we move on. I I think I, I gave you a lot of information. Um, it, it was it was intentional because I will share my you will get my presentation afterwards, and I hope you will you will have enough resources that you can then use when I'm not there anymore. And I really hope that that some of these things will then come up in the in the breakout rooms. That's why I also mentioned these before so that you know once you try to to see what that means for for your work that we'll have that again. But then I see a raised hand. So just before we move on maybe. Um, yeah. so just because we're very tight on time, um, maybe we can make it quick and then, and then continue it after. Well yeah maybe we can get to it later but I'll just plant the seed which is <laughs> I was quite struck by the the results from the Sorge et al. studies um, uh, and wondered um, in general, how does one come, you know, deal with those kinds of effects? Because one potential impact is that it introduces bias into who can do the experiments, right? Yeah. And um, so anyway, I can just plant that seed and we can get to it later for sure. Yeah. I can only say that they're not the only ones finding this. So there, there have been a few other reports because the first one was like, well, maybe it's their lab. Uh, I mean, Jeff Mogul is lucky enough to be quite established in this field, so that <laughs> didn't kind of jeopardize his career. But then a few other groups actually found similar things with, with other uh, mechanisms, all, all mostly in the field of, of pain. Um, but yeah, of course, it introduces bias. And I think it's, it's something we can pick up maybe later on on, on how, how to deal with that, because the, the, the approaches and the solutions are, there's none, I don't think there's a black and white, uh, but there, there's opportunities to, to discuss how to mitigate that. Okay, uh, so thanks again, Sabine, for the very interesting talk. Hopefully, we can we can continue to discuss uh, some of the issues you brought up uh, a bit later. So now we want to move on to the two uh, in-house uh, researcher experiences. So this will give us an idea of how some individuals at the Champalimo are, are uh, already incorporating sex and gender into their research. Um, first up, we have Dr. Fatima Cardoso who is a medical oncologist and the director of the breast unit at the Champalimo Clinical Center. Um, she's held this position since uh, its inception in 2010. And there her work focuses on the biology of breast cancer and uh, prognostic and predictive markers of response to systemic uh, therapy. And she's also involved in breast cancer clinical trials. Um, she's received numerous grants and awards and is involved in many, many uh, national and international organizations. Uh, too many to mention here, but, uh, but notably she's, she's the president of the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance. So uh, today she's going to be telling us a bit about uh, sex and gender dimensions in breast cancer clinical research. So please uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Bill, and, and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very, very interesting uh, workshop. And thank you also to Sabine, because she already uh, mentioned, without me knowing her slides and vice versa, uh, she already mentioned some of the issues I will mention as well. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Just let me know if, if uh, you can see it. Yeah, all right. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll focus now on, um, on clinical research and the impact of <clears throat> sex and gender dimensions. And of course, uh, breast cancer is uh, quite an interesting uh, model, if you want, uh, for us to discuss these issues. So these are my disclosures. And I will mention two problems because of time. I don't, I cannot go into the detail of anything else. I'll give you an example of these issues in cancer drug development <clears throat> and a specific example in uh, breast cancer. 
So starting with the, uh, the issue of cancer drug development. So um, Sabine already mentioned these findings and this was um, highlighted in a uh, Nature editorial that calls the attention to the fact that the European Commission is now making mandatory for us to uh, account for sex and gender in all the research that we do. And this came from the, the finding of these 10 prescription drugs that had to be withdrawn because they were found to be more dangerous in women than men and led even to uh, increased mortality. And this um, fact comes from this very uh, recent publication in Journal of Women's Health about what has been happening with the FDA approvals and the change in the FDA approach to drug development um, and to bias in drug development since uh, 2001 or begin late 90s, beginning of 2000s. And there are mainly two aspects to uh, retain. Inequalities in access to clinical trials are many. I think everyone knows about the impact of socioeconomic status. We, we often discuss those, uh, the fact that um, uh, patients that are treated in large comprehensive cancer centers or uh, patients that are wealthy enough to be treated in uh, uh, more developed uh, parts of the country or in more developed countries have much more access to clinical trials than others. But there are many other bias in accessibility to clinical trials. Sex and gender is just one of them. Age is a, a big one. Um, if you see, for example, uh, older or elderly patients rarely are included in clinical trials. And we forget that we are uh, aging uh, species. And then most of the things that we develop in clinical trials do not then apply, or we don't know how they apply to the vast majority of the population that is above 60 or 65. Also race is something that is very, very uh, much influenced about the um, uh, access to clinical trials. And then another point uh, that raises a lot of problems is the fact that the initial studies to study pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are very often done in healthy white male volunteers. So obviously uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics can be different, um, not all the time, depends on the drug, but they can be different in between males and females and they can also be different between white and other uh, Caucasian and other races. Um, and uh, the fact that we only have this uh, information and also toxicity information coming mostly, mostly uh, from these healthy white male volunteers hinders the uh, next steps of the direct drug development. So, uh, I would say that one uh, major consequence is that the trial results that we obtain do not often translate equally to the patient population we have. And this patient population we have is very heterogeneous. And the more you want to apply these clinical trials results to your uh, patient population, if you are extremely restrictive in the inclusion exclusion criteria or in the way that you develop uh, the drug from the beginning, then you're going to have a lot of trouble um, applying the, the, the results of the research uh, to the vast majority of the patient population. So those are some points that I think you can take over in the uh, workshop discussion, the one dedicated to clinical trials. I will now give you a specific example in uh, breast cancer. And I bet I'm going to surprise you with the example I chose, because I think everyone expects a woman to give a woman's example, right? And so uh, let's see if I can surprise you with the, the one I, I decided to show. So I acknowledge that most of you are not experts on breast cancer. So I'll do just three or four introductory slides. Breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. We call breast cancer as if it was one disease, but in fact, it is not. And we knew this for many, many years, but the advent of the decoding of the human genome 
led also to the decoding of several tumors genome and led also to a new molecular classification of many cancers, the first one being breast. And you can see here that there is a variety of subtypes within breast cancer that have a very different natural history. Um, because of the complexity of these uh, tests, we don't actually use frequently these tests in our clinical practice. So we simplify using surrogates by using a very common and, and cheap technique called immunohistochemistry that I'm sure many of you are aware. So we choose where, where we base our, uh, let's say surrogacy in three major receptors. The hormonal receptors that are estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the HER2 receptor. And very simply, we can classify breast cancer in three major diseases. And you can see here that the, the, the most frequent by far is what we can call hormonal dependent breast cancer, which is the breast cancer defined by the presence of these hormonal receptors, estrogen and or progesterone receptor. And then we have the HER2 positive and the absence of these three receptors leads to a group that it's called triple negative breast cancer. So the majority of breast cancers are dependent on hormones and dependent on the presence of hormonal receptors and the interaction between hormones and these receptors. And it's also, I think, relatively easy to remember uh, that Sabine slightly mentioned this already, that the hormonal environment is different uh, between a male and a female. So I'm not going to go into the details of that because it doesn't actually matter for what I'm about to say. But we could uh, hypothesize then that a hormonal dependent cancer will behave differently in a male or a female because the hormonal environment is different. So here I start, some of you are asking, what is she talking about? I thought breast cancer is a female cancer. So the fact is that breast cancer can occur in male patients as well. And so uh, male, male, men can get breast cancer as well, even if that is not known by many men and uh, unfortunately also by many healthcare professionals that forget that men can also have breasts and can also develop uh, breast cancer. And, and that's why, and, and this comes from the fact that male breast cancer is a rare disease. And if you focus on the 1%, so 1% of breast cancers occurs in men and 1% of all tumors in men are actually breast. So 1% defines breast cancer in, in, in men quite well. And they are often forgotten. Who is going to remember 1% of one disease, right? Um, so because of this epidemiology of being a rare disease, the fact is that we do not have randomized clinical data to, the, to base our decisions on how to treat this, this, this disease. Uh, we have now recently important prospective data, but until recently, uh, uh, the available data we had were retrospective case control studies, and we didn't have a lot of data. So basically, how do we treat these patients is extrapolating from all the research that is done in female uh, breast cancer. And the issues relating of having a cancer that it's commonly associated with a female, uh, with a female or, or uh, with women leads to many issues, and I will point out three groups of them, quality of care issues, psychosocial issues, and quality of life issues. And of course that has implications in research. So let's start with quality of care. What you see here is the five-year survival according to the stage of the disease for male and female. And you see that the observed survival, see a lot of difference, men die more or have a worse survival than, than, than female with breast cancer. And this leads, this has, when you analyze the relative survival, meaning that you adjust for age, for gender, for stage of diagnosis and comorbidities, then you see the survivals are very similar. So why is it that the observed survival is different? Well, usually, I'm not going to go into all the details, but 
Men who have breast cancer are diagnosed later, so they are older, they have more comorbidities. Also overall, male have a lower life expectancy than female. And the problem, major problem is because it is a rare disease and not everyone is aware that it exists. There is often a late diagnosis. So um, up until 40% of the cases are diagnosed already in stage three or four. This is terrible. I'll give you the correspondence in female. In developed countries, only about 10 to 15% of breast cancer is diagnosed at stage four. So there is a huge problem of late diagnosis for men. And this is, has strong implications on the survival. So breast cancer, as most of you know, is the cancer where we have seen the biggest advances. We have seen a decrease in mortality by over 50% particularly since the 90s. But in men, we saw a decrease in mortality, but much less, as you can see there, 28%. And how do we treat? So it, uh, we have started looking into the problem of male breast cancer in 2006. Finally, uh, 2008, we were able to have a multidisciplinary meeting sponsored by the NCI in the US and these were the main recommendations that exist. And only last year, so 2020, we got the first set of guidelines uh, for the management of this disease. So you see that even in the clinical field and the research field in clinical um, applications take a long time to evolve addressing all these inequalities. Uh, the, uh, there are other specific issues that I also am not going to go into the details but there are specific psychosocial issues of having a cancer that is so much spoken about related to women. And everybody um, knows about the pink ribbon. I think nobody on earth doesn't know about the pink ribbon, right? So if you are a man and you say, okay, why am I having a female cancer? So this leads to not just the delay in diagnosis, but shock. I didn't even know I had breasts much less that I could have breast cancer. This is very common. Uh, stigma, alterated body image. Everybody thinks about the impact of breast cancer treatment in a female, but they rarely think that a mastectomy for a man is also something that will lead to altered body image. And many of these men no longer take their shirt off on the beach. They don't talk about it with even the friends because this leads to a huge impact and stigma. And of course, that also leads to lack of support, inappropriate information and inappropriate treatment. So many years ago, I, I wanted to start to do something about this and uh, I couldn't find support anywhere. Nobody wanted to focus on this disease. Uh, of course, pharma companies don't wanna focus on 1% of breast cancer, but even the academic research did not think it was worthwhile to invest a lot of time and resources uh, for this. So finally, after a lot of pushing, those who know me know that I'm very persistent and very pushing. If not by anything else, I win things by tiredness of the other uh, people. So uh, I finally got a lot of groups getting together and we created this Male Breast Cancer International Program which is really worldwide uh, collaboration to uh, try to find more things about this disease and implications for clinical practice. And this program had three parts. One part was a retrospective joint analysis. So we collected breast cancer samples from a 20 year period from around the world. And we centrally analyze it using very different techniques. The second part, we did a prospective international registry I won't speak a lot about this second part, but we were expecting to have about 100 or 150 in a 30 months period. We had more than 500. So they do exist. We just don't look for them, right? And uh, we wanted also to have a part three of prospective randomized trials. Unfortunately here is where we are getting stuck because this implies a much higher level of investment funds and nobody's willing to provide such uh, funds for this rare disease. 
what have we learned in the first part? So we collected the largest series of male breast cancer with biological data and clinically annotated data as well. So more than 1800 samples from uh, many countries around the world. And we were able to characterize better this disease. And I'll, I'll, I'll just show you the highlights. So what we found is that almost all of them are ER positive. So almost all of them are that group of hormonal dependent uh, uh, breast cancers. And only about 10%, even less, have this HER2 um, receptor. Most important consequence for our clinical practice is if you see a case that has ER negative breast cancer, the first thing you should think is something is wrong with this pathology exam and go back and reanalyze it because it, it almost does not exist that the, a tumor is, for example, triple negative in a male patient. The outcomes we were able to see to, during these 20 years uh, span is that the survival has to do with staging, obviously, as we in, in all tumors. But when you look at the survival of early breast cancer in men, it's clearly uh, less than in female. Unfortunately, the metastatic disease, unfortunately, uh, the, the worst, the bad survival is more or less the same for male and female, about two and a half, three years medium survival. When you look at the outcome by period of diagnosis, you see that for overall mortality, things have improved. We know that we have improved life expectancy for both male and female. When you look at breast cancer specific mortality, you don't see so many advances as we see in female. Um, and something else we saw in this um, uh, study we have done has to do with quality of care. And I know this is a little bit too detailed, but just to tell you that most men were not proposed for having breast conservation surgery. So all of them would just do mastectomy. Uh, not all that needed radiation were receiving it and not a very cheap relatively well tolerated single treatment to give. I, I showed you that almost all of them are ER positive, but only about 77% receive adjuvant endocrine therapy. So clearly substandards of care in this disease. And we could think, okay, maybe this is because it's an old series. 20 years ago, we did things differently. This is a new publication of uh, a, a much recent series, and you still see the same. Underuse of proven treatments, particularly underuse of adjuvant endocrine therapy with, of, of course, impact in survival. What we also see in the second part of our uh, uh, program is the impact of breast cancer diagnosis in quality of life. And a lot of the symptoms are quite similar to male and female, and, and they do, and we see particularly issues of anxiety, depression, but also fatigue, insomnia, and pain. Now I ask a question here is how good are our quality of life tools that were developed to measure quality of life in breast cancer patients? So all of them were developed in female. How good are they to measure quality of life in male breast cancer patients? Because of that, we are developing uh, a new module at the ORTC quality of life tool that takes part of breast cancer module, part of prostate cancer module, and tries to develop a specific quality of life tool to measure quality of life in male patients who have breast cancer to try to be, to capture all the issues that affect quality of life in these patients. So following our, uh, persistency, let's call it this way. Other groups have um, looked into the, the biology of breast cancer and without going into the detail, I'll show you some of the things that were found and that will have an impact in the way we treat. So this group in Denmark went into doing uh, gene profiling in uh, male breast cancer and found that they have a different molecular classification. I showed in the beginning the molecular classification of female breast cancer. In male, we, we find mostly only two subtypes because as I told you, they are almost all ER positive. But within the ER positive, there are two 
uh, uh, subtypes. I have no idea why I decided to call them male complex and male simple. We can do a lot of jokes about these, uh, these uh, names for the subtypes, but the male complex is very similar to the female uh, luminal or ER positive disease. And the male simple, which is less common, is also something that does not exist in female breast cancer. So it's very specific of male breast cancer. So what the researchers are doing now is try to characterize this male simple, simple in terms of biomarkers and try to find out if there is one biomarker that we can then develop a target treatment uh, for this specific subtype of, of male breast cancer. We were we try to reproduce this research in our international male breast cancer program and we were able to do so. So we proved in an independent series that these sub two subtypes do exist in male breast cancer. And we are now going with RNA sequencing, trying to dissect the characteristics of these subtypes. So another group in Italy were able to find differently expressed genes between female and male and found that there is a particular pathway, which is this mTOR pathway, that is highly overexpressed in male breast cancer uh, patients. And this has been found also in other studies where genes that are part of this pathway are particularly overexpressed in uh, male breast cancer. And why is this important? Is because we have several new drugs that target this pathway and that we can use specifically for these patients. We are already trying that and seeing excellent responses with the association of endocrine therapy and drugs that target this pathway. Uh, one point that is out there for a huge uh, research is the role of the androgen receptor in, uh, in uh, breast cancer. Actually, androgen receptor is important for all endocrine uh, tumors, and it behaves different, for example, in breast tissue and in prostate tissue. It behaves differently in the presence or absence of estradiol. And so very, very possibly, it behaves different in female and male breast cancer. So there's a lot of research around the issue of androgen receptor, why is it important? Because we have several antagonists and several uh, inhibitors and also agonists of the androgen receptor that we can use in prostate cancer that we are starting to use in uh, female breast cancer and we possibly can use in male breast cancer in the future. And I will finalize by the way I started. So male patients were very, very often excluded from clinical trials in breast cancer. And I think you understood by now that it will be very hard to have a randomized clinical trial, much less several randomized clinical trials for such a rare disease. So what we have to do is stop excluding male patients from entering breast cancer trials. And you know, I wrote this editorial, I was still young, in 2010, and it took about 10 years for the FDA to issue a guidance, so it came out last year, on not excluding male patients from trials of breast cancer, except if there is a very, very strong scientific reason to do so. So finally, uh, both academia and pharma have a guidance that the FDA will not accept exclusion of male patients from uh, breast cancer clinical trials, unless you have a very good justification uh, to do that. So major take home messages from everything I told you is think very carefully on inclusion exclusion criteria when you are developing a trial and do not exclude unless there is an absolute ne need to do so. And this goes for age, goes for gender, uh, goes for race and everything else. And uh, there, also, there is a second bias regarding clinical trials that comes from clinical, uh, from physicians in clinical practice. We should present the possibility of the trial to all potentially eligible patients and let them decide if they want to enter the trial or not. We should not decide up front, oh, I will not present to this patient because I think she's too old, I think he's too old, or um, I think he's not going to say yes, or she's not going to say yes. Let them decide 
and do not pre-decide based on, on your bias. So finally, I always have to thank all the, the people who invested a lot of resources and time for this work and particularly Breast Cancer Research Foundation, which was the only funding agency in, uh, that really gave funds for this. And I think you all know about the pink ribbon, but maybe you do not know that the newest pink ribbons have a blue dot, as you can see there. And this blue dot represents the 1% of male breast cancers. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Fatima, for that uh, the very nice talk. I think it's a very nice example of how sex and gender can affect disease and, and treatment. So I think, uh, okay, we have one question in the in the chat from Christina Joel. Um, is there a way to screen breast cancer in males? Um, ultrasound is beneficial or only when the, uh, there are symptoms? So screening is a different thing than early diagnosis. So there's a lot of discussion about screening. Screening means detecting before it is palpable or before it gives any symptoms. And population screening is not something we should use for a rare disease, whichever rare disease we are talking about. But awareness and early diagnosis is crucial. So we have to educate uh, general practitioners. We have to educate the general population that men have breasts too, that men breasts should be examined as well. And that if a man finds a lump, which is very, let's say easier for a man to find a lump than a female, that they should not ignore it and come quickly for a medical attention. That is much better. So awareness and early diagnosis, screening for rare diseases is not indicated. Okay, I think uh, due to time constraints, we'll have to move on, but we'll try to uh, perhaps pass these additional questions on to-, to, to Sure, Fatima. happy. Um, so thank you again. Um, we're going to have a short break now. Um, so we ask that everyone uh, stays connected to, to the Zoom. Um, we'll return after this with the second uh, in-house uh, research example from Clara Ferreira and then we'll go to the breakout sessions. Um, we're going to start organizing these breakout sessions during this break. So uh, we ask that everyone, um, if you could have your name reflect the, the name that you used to sign up so that we can, we can organize things a bit better. Um, and we'll, we'll return um, in, uh, in 10 minutes at 11.15. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, so we're now going to continue with our second uh, in-house research example from Dr. Clara Ferreira. And so we already heard about a, an example from uh, human research. Uh, this is going to now focus more on animal research. So Clara started out uh, actually qualifying as a teacher and teaching for a couple of years. And then she then went to study biology and did a master's degree in cellular and molecular biology. She then did her PhD with uh, Gero Miesenbach in Oxford studying olfactory decision-making in Drosophila melanogaster. And since 2014, she is a postdoctoral researcher in the Moita lab at the Champalimau Research, where she researches social mediation of defensive behaviors in groups of flies. And she'll tell us a bit about that today. Take it away, Clara. Okay, thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you all for listening to my talk now. So this is going to be, quite different from the talks we've heard so far. That was sort of the point. And what I hope to convey to you today is somewhat my serendipitous or maybe even haphazard way I've ended up taking into account uh, sex in my research. So let me just try to, okay. Just, do you see my screen? Can I get a nod? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so I study, um, and we study in the lab um, uh, social behaviors in a group context. And this is, of course, uh, in, a, in a group context or in a society as a place where social behaviors emerge and often actually are impacted upon by several individuals of both sexes and in human societies also of the variety of genders uh, that, that are around. 
and uh, what I study specifically are social behaviors within the context of predation. And this is because predation is actually thought to be a key driving force for group formation because it affords the usage of social cues for predator detection, it allows for concerted defense responses, and it can also dilute uh, your risk, your individual risk of predation. So being in a group constitutes a safety in numbers effects that actually allows individuals to um, have decreased vigilance, engage in other activities, lowers their stress responses, and can also diminish the defense responses uh, that they display. And although we know this uh, exists throughout the animal kingdom, we don't really know much about the mechanisms or really the impact of sex uh, on it at all. So uh, to study the, these issues, I use fruit flies for a few reasons. The, one of the main ones, so the starting point for it, uh, them is actually that they live in groups. So they aggregate on ripening fruit where they, they eat, they uh, mate and they oviposit and they do display uh, social mediation of behaviors. Then uh, the fruit fly of course allows us uh, to get uh, to the neuronal mechanisms um, in depth and in relatively in a relatively fast period of time, which is very advantageous to understand uh, basic principles. And finally, also, we can look at uh, large numbers of individuals uh, in detail and get a detailed description of their behavior and also have very high ends that allow us to see uh, a variation within a population. So how do we go about studying these uh, uh, social or this group uh, effect on defense behaviors? So we use looming stimulus in the lab. This basically um, imitates the way a predator or an object uh, increases in size on your visual field on a collision course. And um, we know that this uh, type of stimulus um, will lead to the deployment of either flight or freezing responses in animals that use vision and fruit flies are no exception. So we use uh, a screen to provide uh, 20 looming stimuli after a five minute baseline um, during a five minute stimulation onto uh, backlit uh, arenas. Sorry, I jumped. Um, this work uh, that uh, I've been doing and also the previous work of um, the PhD student in the lab has actually been using female flies as actually most of the work in our lab uh, is being done, um, except one or two inroads recently. And this, uh, I believe, was actually simply because at the time uh, this PhD student, Zaka, uh, found that in his hands, fruit, the females showed more robust uh, freezing responses, which was what we were studying. So we ended up sort of just using uh, females, though I did actually have data for both sexes. Now, this for me was quite um, refreshing in a way, because in my previous work, my PhD, it was all based on males. And there the rationale was sort of, well, uh, females show higher variability because of um, their reproductive status. Although I never really saw any data that amounted to that, nor did I actually uh, acquire any. But so I was happy that we were focusing on females. So um, what I did was image the um, flies in, in individually tested flies all the way up to groups of 10 individuals. And we extract their XY positions and also pixel change around the flies so that we can disentangle instances of immobility, which is what we see um, mostly within this setup. So this freezing, this tonic immobility response. So what I'm showing you now is a, a, an abbreviated version of these results in females. And here what you see is the proportion of flies freezing throughout 500 millisecond bins um, throughout the experiment. And these dashed lines represent the looming stimulus presentations. In dark brown here, we have flies tested individually. Here, flies tested in groups of two to five. And down here, all the way to the yellow, flies tested in groups of 10. And what you can clearly see is that flies tested individually show the highest proportion of flies freezing, followed by these groups of two to five, where flies actually spend less time freezing because they engage more in freezing breaks in between the looming presentations. And finally, flies in groups of six to 10 display the lowest proportion of flies freezing, which is also, in, um, which is further due to an increase, uh, a decrease in freezing entry in the first place. 
So in females, um, we found that flies in groups display lower sustained freezing, so they show this sort of safety in numbers effect that scales with group size. And we sort of had the intuition uh, by looking um, at uh, many, many, many videos and by analyzing our data that this was due to motion cues of others. So here we focus now just on groups of five, which we thought would allow us to really explore um, the group effect by either being able to make the flies freeze more or freeze less. So this intermediate response would allow for this, these manipulations. And so what we did first was, okay, we think it's uh, this motion cue, how can we manipulate the motion cue itself while maintaining the number of individuals constant? And so what I'm showing you here are flies in groups of five in red, five wild type flies, and here in blue, one focal wild type fly surrounded by four blind flies whose trace is down here in gray. Now, these four blind flies that are surrounding this wild type fly, they don't perceive the looming stimulus and they're basically just moving around the entirety of the, of the experiment time. And so in essence, what we have is an increase in motion signal in this case. So what this shows us was that indeed, increasing the motion signal that surrounds a, a focal fly increases the group effect, thereby decreasing an individual's freezing. So these motion cues were the safety signal now, to further follow up, we actually wanted to understand a bit about the circuitry. And here we managed to find a role for these LC11 neurons that are depicted here. These are visual projection neurons that were known to respond to the movement of small, of, of small objects. And by inactivating these neurons here, this purple trace, uh, what you see is that by diminishing the perception of the motion of others, we were able to actually decrease the group effect, increasing freezing responses compared to controls. So this was very, very nice. And it's lead, uh, this led us to this uh, fantastic position where we actually now have uh, an inroad via these LC11 neurons to understand how social cues can impact an individual behavior. This, however, in females, but like I told you, I had data for the males. So just out of curiosity, I decided, let me have a little look what's going on there. And of course, I mean, this is of no surprise, whether for people working in flies or for people working in, in rodents and other models, that there are um, sex dimorphisms in behavior, particularly pertaining to, to reproduction. And uh, in flies, it's actually quite well characterized that even these um, reproductive related behaviors can be impacted upon by the group that surrounds you and the sex of the animals that are around. Also, um, aggression is another example where you, you have sort of monomorphic uh, as well as dimorphic behavioral aspects. And again, this also depends on the sex of the other animal, and it can also depend uh, on, on what's going on in terms of the surrounding group. This is the behavioral level, but there's also quite ample evidence for um, sex dimorphisms at the neuronal level. So whether they're actually um, sex dimorphic circuitry or uh, also, sometimes actually the same neurons can, uh, through either similar or different stimulus, lead to sex dimorphic behaviors. So there's, there's a lot of evidence out there that uh, there can be sex dimorphisms in social behaviors. So what about my data? So when I went back to look uh, at these male groups, I found uh, that males in groups of five here, this dark red uh, line, actually froze less than groups of five females. Interestingly, this was not the case when I looked at individual, uh, at the behavior when they tested individually, which is depicted here in these uh, lighter uh, lines. Now, although I didn't see a difference between the individual behavior that did, uh, or a statistical difference, there did seem to be a slight difference in behavior there. So I just want to check whether if now we look at the fold change, so the difference um, between the freezing responses uh, in groups of five compared to the individuals, we clearly see that males show uh, a stronger group effect. So they have an eightfold reduction in time freezing compared to the females twofold reduction. Now, 
the people the work um, with flies know this quite well, males actually walk faster than females. So this could simply be just because the males produce higher motion cues than females, as I've shown you before, then in females, we showed that motion cues were important or are the, the main factor that leads to this group behavior. And so unfortunately, I can't see my graph that should be here showing you precisely that indeed males produce uh, or are exposed to a higher motion signal than females throughout the entirety of the experiment. However, when I now go and look at the proportion of time that males spend freezing for um, lower male, uh, to, to lower exposures of motion cues in males that are actually similar to those experienced by females, here, this gray bar, what we see is that the, the cumulative frequency of time freezing in males is left shifted, which means that there are uh, lower values of time freezing, which means that even for similar motion cues, males are actually freezing less in groups than females. So this was very, very interesting. And it argued that maybe there's uh, some dimorphism at the neuronal level. And I decided to look at whether this was already instantiated at the sensory level. And again, very, very interestingly, while as in females, as I showed you previously, these LC11 neurons mediate the motion cue in males in activating these neurons had no effect. So this is really, really cool. And it's opened up um, a whole new project that I'm going to be working on uh, with Miriam, a PhD student in the lab, actually trying to identify what it are the neuronal mediators of this um, motion cue in males. And this is further, uh, even further interesting because we're going to collaborate um, with uh, Mark Fry that does imaging on these uh, visual projection neurons. And interestingly as well there, they are focused mostly on females and there the rationale is simply that females are easier to manipulate and they're bigger so that they are easier to image from. So it will be very interesting to do this uh, sex comparative analysis now. So yeah, a bit haphazardly um, and now um, from now on I will have this uh, much more in attention, the, the sex aspect in research, but haphazardly I've actually ended up with uh, what I think will be a very interesting project looking at sex dimorphism uh, in this context of group behaviors and uh, social behaviors in the defensive context. So just to finish off, I would like to thank the whole Champalimau um, environment and in particular my lab as well as the Fly scientific hardware and software platforms and I leave it at that. So I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thanks very much, Clara. Um, so I just wanted to say generally, uh, we apologize that it seems like there's not, not so much time in between the talks for questions. Um, we have a very packed schedule. Um, so if you do have any pressing questions about any of the talks, you can feel free to enter them into the chat. Um, and uh, does anybody have any quick questions about uh, Clara's talk for now? I don't see anyone with their, is there someone? Uh, Daniela? Hi, Clara. Hi. Very interesting. Did you ever try to put males and females together? I mean, do, can you do that experiment or they try to mate or something? Yeah, no, <laughs> so, so I actually, I have tried that. Um, I need to redo it again. So I think that's very interesting. There were, I, at the beginning, I was thinking about two aspects. So these I actually use mated. So they're somewhat satiated, so when I've put males and females together from these conditions, I haven't really seen them, or maybe once or twice I've seen them actually try to engage in the sexual behavior rather than just being calmly there. So, but I, I need to revisit uh, that data again. I find that very interesting as well, how it's going to play. Okay, any other questions for now? I guess also the people that are interested in behavior will be within my group, so then we can maybe discuss a bit further. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again, Clara.
So I think now we're going to move on to the last part of the workshop, which is the breakout sessions. So I, I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, okay. Okay, so, so the idea now is for us to take this knowledge that we've been talking about and think about our own projects. We're going to divide you into rough groups. Uh, they are not necessarily going to be groups where everyone is studying the same thing, but we hope that um, you can have uh, interesting discussions regardless. So, we have these five general categories. And the idea is that you'll have 30 minutes to discuss your, your research, whether or not you already think about sex and gender um, based on the discussion so far, how you would go about trying to incorporate this, uh, uh, as well as uh, questions that are remaining, any concerns. Um, and we'll give you uh, a slide, one per group to, to make some notes. And in the end, we'll invite you, you back and, and we'll ask for, a, a, I guess, a brief summary from each group with just some main points that came up during the, the discussion. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, as I said, this is the, the general idea. So sharing your own research questions, um, and thinking about how, how what you saw today applies. So um, I, think, I think that's about it. Is there anything, Sabine, you have? Yeah, I cannot <laughs> raise the fact. Maybe one thing for, for the groups is, um, I think you might be in, in, in different moments uh, with with this uh, process of incorporating sex and gender, you know, you might be thinking about a grant, but maybe it's just something you you start, uh, you know, thinking about right now. So if you feel that there's, um, I would say, bullet points you would like to share with the whole group afterwards in terms of, okay, this this came up and 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 we'd like to make that available to everyone. I think that's one opportunity. But maybe within the group, you just, um, you know, you could just come up with certain difficulties or questions or you know things where you're like okay I have to think about this this is also fine and so if, if no slides come out of this but you just want to share uh, also the questions that came up and you know maybe other people have similar things and you kind of can connect also after a workshop that's also an opportunity so I don't think um, necessarily every group has has to produce a slide so it might it's just uh, um, an opportunity to foster the discussion and in, in how all of this that we'll be discussing today fits into uh, what you're doing or maybe it doesn't so uh, so you can share that with the group first and then maybe with, with a larger group. And i'll just add there's so there's no pressure with this sort of thing if you if you haven't thought about or you're not sure about how this uh, how sex and gender would be incorporated into your research. I think that's what these discussions are for. So, so I think uh, Laura is going to handle the breakout sessions now. So we'll see you all in a bit uh, after after these are completed.